non-compete highlights. March 31st, 2021. In organizing and movement building, one common problem that people often face is that there's not enough participation. Uh, either there's small membership or maybe you have a decent size, mem size membership, but those members are not participating. They're just paper members, but they're not really active. So what do we do about that? And uh, thankfully, social psychology has some insights we can use. We'll start with a research experiment from the 1960s by psychologists Jonathan L. Friedman and Scott C. Fraser. Uh, this took place in a California suburb called Palo Alto. And the researchers went door to door in a neighborhood asking uh, people at the door, hey, can we put a sign in your, art, in your yard that says drive carefully? Now, this sign was huge. It was an eyesore, like it was just like, drive carefully. Uh, so most people unsurprisingly said no. Only 17% said yes. Okay, so then the researchers went to another neighborhood and this time they went door to door, but they asked, can we put this small sign in your window that says, be a safe driver? So people were like, yeah, you know, it's just a little sign in the window, sure. Most people said yes. Now, a couple weeks later, they went back to that same neighborhood where they were asking about the small sign. And they asked, can we put this huge, big ass drive carefully sign in your front lawn? This time, 76% said yes. And again, in the other neighborhood, it was only 17%. So that's about 4.5 times more people saying yes. So why the difference? The theory is that people like to stay consistent uh, with their past statements, with their beliefs, with their commitments. So when you agree to put a small sign in your window, you've basically made a small commitment to promoting safe driving. And you start to think of yourself as an advocate for safe driving. And now the large sign just becomes this logical next step to stay consistent in your values and your identity. And people like that because when you're consistent, it feels like you're being true to yourself. And if you're not being consistent or if you're being inconsistent, now that feels like you're just going against yourself. You're contradicting yourself. You're betraying your own values. And people don't like to do that. So the lesson from that is if you can convince someone to make even just a small commitment they're more likely to continue in that direction. Now, this is often called the foot in the door technique because you can get a small yes that gets your foot in the door and now you can move on to hopefully get a bigger yes. So now, you can use, yep. So I'm just gonna come in with the only reference I know. Um, basically it's like all those like weird anime games where they're like, oh, join the club. It, it will be like, it'll be fine and the main characters hates like all the clubs, but then he joins anyway. And then it's uh -huh. like a, the small foot in the door thing. And then he stays in the club, kind of like Doki Doki Literature Club. I wish I watched more anime so I could get that reference, but I think I, I think I get what you're saying. So they sort of, they get them, they get them to just join the club and from then they can like draw them in further to more of their maybe weird acti the activities they're doing there. Yes. Kind okay, of like cool. This is useful both in anime and also in organizing, or hopefully there would be, <laughs> <laughs> or hopefully there would be maybe an anime about organizing, which there should be more animes there about organizing. Be. That's um, that. This this is a message for you, all you anime <laughs> animators. Yeah. Call. I'm sure there's a word for that. I don't. Um. Yes. Um. So. Again, there's there's this common problem in, in organizing activism and so on, that there's just not enough participation. The membership base is small. We need to draw in more people or the members are not actively participating. So a way to deal with that is try to get a small yes from people. Just ask something small, like sign a petition. And from there, you can then more easily maybe get a bigger yes, like will you attend a meeting? Will you hand out leaflets? And then from there, you can maybe get them to agree to do something uh, even more, participate even further. So the strategy is basically drawing people in in small increments. You get a small commitment, small level of participation, and you nudge them forward gradually. This um, is so much like the marketing the marketing funnel. I was a marketer yes. for like a decade. It's I, always just like first, like click the link and then subscribe to the email newsletter. And then eventually it's like, spend the money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually like, 
I, I know like as anarchists, communists, socialists, we're probably like cringing at the idea of marketing, but there are insights from there that can be used for anti-market purposes, for like purposes of fighting the market. And I think we should not cringe at them. We should, you know, learn lessons from our enemies, not some of the lessons from them we don't want to learn, but some of them might be <laughs> useful and we can apply them in, in good ways. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, they, they spend millions and millions of dollars on like research on psychological research and stuff like that. So it's like, yeah. we don't have those resources. So we have to kind of crib and adapt. Well, we, we can. can to... Yeah, exactly. Well, we can learn from their research that they, they've done for us. <laughs> we can figure it out. And exactly. pull, it won't always apply. Sometimes it'll be like, who wants to drink Coca-Cola? We don't give a shit about it. <laughs> but like, right. <laughs> this kind of stuff is cool. Um, okay, so this foot in the door method can be used for both outreach and inreach. So outreach would be uh, reaching out to people who are not in your organization, just like anyone you want to like, like if, if you have a workplace committee and you're trying to draw in coworkers who are not yet in the committee, you can use it for that. Or if you're, you know, organizing a tenants union, uh, you, you can, you know, use it for people who are not, a, not yet in the tenants union and so on. But it can also be used for inreach, which is people within your own organization, people who might be signed up officially as members, but they're actually just paper members. They're not really participating. And you can still use this foot in the door technique to sort of try to draw them back in and make them more active. Um, so the foot in the door technique, it helps increase people's participation, but it can also help with increasing people's comfort level with bold tactics, going from more more tame tactics to more bold, risky, mil militant, radical tactics. So you might, start people with signing a petition. Maybe if they're willing to sign a petition, now they might next be willing to mar do a march on the boss. Um, and if they're willing to do that, now they might feel comfortable with doing an hour long sit down strike. And if they're willing to do an hour long sit down strike, maybe next they'll be willing to do an unlimited sit down strike. Next thing you know, they feel okay with occupying the whole factory and then we have a revolution. So <laughs> obviously, <laughs> yes. Uh, obviously easier said than done. Um, so, you know, each of those steps can take a lot of work to get people from A to B to C to D, but having things laid out like that and moving people along gradually like that can make people more comfortable with the next step. Um, so I don't want to yeah. make it sound easy, but this will, it's, it's always going to be a struggle. It's always going to be hard, but this will make it easier. Yeah. This is this is great um, because I'm just thinking about an organization I'm in. Yeah. And um, it's a group of all sorts of different people, um, but we feel like we've been like losing touch with a certain group of people, like the okay. labor people. Right. Oh, like over the course of COVID, like okay. they became, be, they have become like less and less active because. They typically like to meet in person and we're not doing a whole lot of meetings in person anymore. Yeah. So they're not like even participating in the org at all, almost. Yeah. And we've been trying to like figure out ways to like draw them back in. And that's, this is great because um, it's gonna give me all sorts of ideas. Oh, that's great. I'm so glad to hear that. Another thing, this wasn't in the presentation, so I'm going a bit off script here, but it can help to have like, depending on how many, how much capacity you have, like to either have like someone whose job, like within, not job, sorry, their role within the organization is in reach. You can have one person who's, whose role is in reach or you can have a whole committee, an in reach committee. And their whole focus is to reach out to other members in the organization and like, you know, call them, text them, you know, try to try to keep that connection going um, and, and, and so on like this. I hate to bring up the marketing thing again, but yeah. one thing that I know is from advertising is you always try to go after the people who've already made a purchase you right. know, when you're doing marketing because the resistance to buy again is way lower. And it, it's like, I, I don't remember the exact number, but um, you spend like $1 to get a repeat customer back versus like $10 for a new customer. And it yeah. also links in with the question CJ1295 just asked, asked which is... Um, is the foot in the door similar to the far right pipeline? I think it is, and I think that um, I mean, I, you know, based on my video on the on the PD pipeline with the uh, pyramid of violence and the stochastic violence, uh, stochastic terrorism, 
uh, pipeline. Um, I do think it's kind of the same principles at work where it's like you're yeah. starting out at a very small level and you're getting people uh, brought in more and more. Um, I think this is just kind of the way, I mean, this is just kind of a, a universe. Is, is, is that true? Is that, does that, is that ring, ring true to you, Lucky Black Hat? Basically, that, like, yeah. It's almost that, like a universal principle. Yeah. I mean, there are some people who will make huge leaps in either their actions or their beliefs or, or what they're comfortable with. But most people will be drawn incrementally into something, whether that's right. for better or for worse. So our goal is to try to use that for good. Um, yeah. Now, we, we, of course, we don't want to be manipulative. We don't want to be, to me, manipulative means that you're being dishonest and right, right. that you're um, tr doing something that's f for, you're using someone for your own purposes. Now, that's not what this is about. You want to be honest. You want to be transparent. And, you know, obviously the people that we're working with are, it, it's not about like something for ourselves. It's about our collective liberation. It's about them too. And so, so I, I wouldn't consider this, you know, so, so, so yeah, you, you don't want to be manipulative. You want to be yeah. on it. It's um, just the same as propaganda, you know, like we're, we, I, I, this is the last thing I'll say, and then I'll shut up and you can continue the presentation, but propaganda can also be like used for good and it can be honest or it can be like, yeah. propaganda is just persuasive communication Exactly. and you yeah. can be honest or you can be dishonest and manipulative. It's the same, it's the same principle. I Absol think it sounds very absolutely. similar. Absolutely. Yeah, I know the, the word propaganda has been turned into something dirty. Uh, and, you know, we, we probably shouldn't use it because people will misunderstand. But propaganda, yeah, it just means any sort of material that's attempting to persuade someone. So um, and there's the, it's not necessarily dishonest and we should never be. Dis we don't have to be dishonest in order to win like our enemies do because they're trying the to. Truth's sell on our side. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we should always be honest. Um, yeah, honest propaganda. <laughs> Uh, okay, so now that we've looked at this social psychology experiment, um, we want to see that is it validated by actual real life? Um, you know, is it just some wankery academic, or is it actually real? Sh well, I guess it's not. You know, you know what I'm saying. Does it does it actually work for activism and organizing? And the answer is that it very much seems that it does. So the example we'll focus on. Um, for the foot in the door technique is the Quebec student strike of 2012. So Quebec is a province in Canada. It has a population of over 8 million. Um, and Quebec has the lowest tuition fees of any province in Canada. And that's thanks in part to a history of student strikes. Uh, in early 2010, the Quebec government announced a plan to raise tuition fees by 75% over five years starting in 2012. So that's a huge increase, 75%. Uh, obviously, students were very unhappy about this. Uh, so they decided we need to do something. Um, so there's three major student associations in Quebec. There's the FEUQ, the, FE, the FECQ, and CLASSE, which is Class A. Um, so Class A was the most and is the most radical of all of them. They're the most radical in their goals. Their goal is for free post-secondary education. And they're also radical in their structures. They're into direct democracy decision-making in weekly student assemblies, rather than just having elected, uh, delegated executive power. You know, So they, they want that sort of grassroots power from below anarchist style of organizing and decision-making. Uh, and also, Class A represented half of the striking students. So not only were they the most radical, but they were the biggest, which is great. Um, and how did they do that? Well, um, student organizers in Class A used the foot in the door method to gradually es escalate people's participation and the tactics that were used in this struggle. So from the start, the organizers said, if we want to stop this tuition increase, we need to have an unlimited general student strike, period. Okay, so by unlimited, that means for as long as it took to make the government cave in. And general meaning at every single university and college across uh, the province. So they said this repeatedly to students from the start, but they knew that the strike wouldn't have enough support or mobilization behind it. Uh, at least not yet. So they didn't try to leap into it. That would have been a failed mission. Uh, they started by asking students to sign petitions. 
Now, normally, obviously, like, you know, change.org, all that shit is probably not going to do very much uh, at all, if anything, right? Uh, but as part of a movement building strategy, petitions can actually be really effective. So they got 30,000 signatures on this petition. Uh, from there, they escalated to having protests, a whole bunch of protests. They also escalated from there to occupying university buildings and more protests, and they even had a one-day strike. Uh, the goal from all this act action, they didn't think it was going to win their demands. Their goal was basically to build the movement, to draw in as many students as possible to be active and participating. And it worked. Gradually, through all of this, they drew more and more students into the movement. Um, and as all of this was going on, there was also ongoing student assemblies at each school. And in these assemblies, there was discussion and decision making, you know, direct democracy, that very like anarchist bottom up style of including everyone, having everyone participate, having everyone shape the direction of the movement. Now, that doesn't mean that there's no like leaders in the sense of people who are taking a more active role and trying to push things in the more, um, you know, radical direction because there very much was. But, you know, they weren't controlling things from the top down. They weren't these executives that were trying to shape things in the sense of, um, you know, pushing it without consent, they were trying to persuade, make everyone understand that this is what needs to happen. Uh, and they would, you know, bring that up in, in these meetings uh, and also, you know, on, on the picket line or, or sorry, on, on, in, in the protest and whatever. So uh, like, you know, through speeches of the protest, et cetera. Um, so as each of these actions failed along the way and, and get, didn't get the results they wanted, eventually, the students started to realize that those who had been calling for the unlimited general student strike had been right this whole time. You know, nothing else is working. We need to go all in. We need to go all the way. So they held a strike vote and the majority voted yes. So the strike began in February 2012. That was two years after the movement began. So they had been working at this a long time. Um, and at the peak of the strike, there was 175,000 students involved who were in, in the strike. That is over half of Quebec's 342,000 post-secondary students. And in their demonstrations were also huge. They had up to 200,000 students as well as supporters involved. Um, through, through all this, there, there was a lot of, uh, you know, confrontations with the cops and with the state. There were 3,000 arrests over the course of this movement. Um, and the Quebec, the Quebec government, in an effort to stop this, passed something called Law 12 uh, that criminalized protests within 50 meters of a school. I was just thinking about how that was their last just effort when it was already way too late. Oh, and, yeah. <laughs> and we've had some more things like that in the United States, and it never pans out. Yeah, they, it's, a, it's a clear sign of desperation, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, they, they, they passed this very desperate law and yeah, it didn't, it didn't work out for them. So they, they uh, criminalized protests within 50 meters of schools. They also criminalized protests anywhere that didn't tell police the planned route in, in advance. Um, and now the fines for violating this law were actually very intense. So you could be fined, uh, just as an individual, you'd be fined up to $5,000 for violating this law. Uh, if you were a student leader, though, you could be fined up to $35,000. And uh, if for your organization violating this law, $125,000 fine. So th these are like big, yeah, yeah, exactly. Scary, scary, big penalties. Um, but people did not give a... So May 22nd, very shortly after the law was passed, hundreds of thousands of people marched in Montreal to protest the law. And this is considered the largest act of civil disobedience in Canadian history, only because this protest itself was, was illegal. You know, they didn't follow the rules of this new law. Um, so, you know, the, the, the best way to, to, to get rid of a law is to break it on, like, in, in big, big numbers. And that's what happened. So... The civil disobedience continued after that big march. Uh, there continued to be spontaneous demonstrations in various neighborhoods. Uh, there'd be several simultaneous marches, uh, each one having hundreds or sometimes even thousands of peoples. And the cops, they can't deal very well with like 
a bunch of shit going on at the same time. If there's like one centralized march with a whole shit ton of people, it's a lot easier for the cops to deal with that than even if there's smaller numbers, but they're broken up all over the place. Yeah, basically the, these these protests happening all over the place, it's fairly hard for the cops to keep control of them if they're happening in a bunch of different places at once. Uh, it's just a big logistics problem. It's easier to just deal with one centralized protest. Um, so yeah, so there were at, at its this continued for two weeks, all these like decentralized protests in different neighborhoods all going on at the same time. Um, at its peak, there were tens of thousands of of people involved in like separate marches all over the city, basically dozens of protests happening at the same time. Um, so once a movement is this big, it basically has like a gravity of its own and it draws people in without needing to use the foot in the door technique. The foot in the door technique is very good for like building that momentum. But as when you, when you get to the size like this, people just start like getting sucked in. Um, Reminds you a lot of like Black Lives Matter last year. Absolutely, um, yeah. Sometimes stuff when stuff like that happens, people can often just assume it's just like a spontaneous uprising. And in many ways it is, but behind the scenes, there was often a lot of organizing to mobilize those right. initial people that got involved. That's um, what a lot of black activists I've talked to have said is that like oh, Black really? Lives Matter seems like it came out of nowhere, but people have been working back like, you know, back into like the nineties and before, you know, like there's this 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 long legacy. And it's like the the abolish the police um movement you know that, that's got long roots going back a long time yes. and they did a lot of work to get to the point where when black lives matter exploded there were like kind of like this apparatus in place to push the agenda yeah. and that sort of thing so yeah even yeah. even even now there's all sorts of planning going on for the black lives matter protest because we know it's going to be an inevitable inevitable that like some sort of thing starts up again so like people are planning now and preparing for that. Good. It's like Gr Gramsci talked about, um, I'll just try to put this out quickly, but like Gramsci mm -hmm. talked about how crisis is inevitable under capitalism. And so we should use crises as like our artillery and just like <laughs> always expect there to be a crisis around the corner and be the, the thing we need to do is be ready through organizing to take advantage of that crisis when it happens. So absolutely. Makes yeah. Organizing can be like considered like uh gathering the tinder right like like stacking up all your wigs and 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 i don't know other pieces of wood and so on and you might be like oh we're not getting results why isn't nothing happening from this oh shit uh but then the spark comes and boom but if you hadn't gathered that tinder that whole time the spark would come thing so like i think a lot of time we can get discouraged as like organizers and activists because we're laying all this shit down and it doesn't seem like very much momentum is coming from it but like trust me it will matter it, it's all about per, like getting things ready for as as you said uh the right moment for that spark to come and like set shit off so yeah ab absolutely um so anyways, so this uh, Quebec uh, student strike went on for over six months and in the end, they won. So the tuition increase was canceled. Uh, the worst aspects of law 12 were repealed and eventually the law expired. Um, and also there was like just the fact that they had mass resistance and, and mass civil disobedience to and made law 12 just basically unenforceable, I think should also count as a victory. Um, now they didn't win for abolishing tuition fees, which as I mentioned, was like a goal of class A. So I guess it wasn't, it wasn't a total victory in that sense, but at least they got the tuition increase canceled. So that's good. Um, so if you'd like to learn, anyone watching this wants to learn more about uh, the Quebec student strike, I would recommend um, reading Organize to Strike, Fight to Win, Quebec's 2012 student strike by Class A. So this is written by the organizers who were involved in doing all the shit I just described. It's obviously best to hear it from the people themselves who did this shit. They they will, you'll get the inside scoop. So again, that is Organize the Strike, Fight to Win, Quebec's 2012 student strike by C-L-A-S-S-E, -S -S -E, and it's online for free. You can find it. Oh, nice. Very cool. Subscribe, 